who I am. I've written a bunch of books. The most recent is this one, Message Not Received. I'll have a few as giveaways for my pop culture references. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a technology authority. I spent about nine years before I wrote and spoke for a living, implementing different systems within companies. And I joke, if I didn't write my first book, Why Do Systems Fail, I would have needed to see the shrink. <laughs> These days, I work as a public speaker. And I was, as I will talk about in a bit, I'm a recovering email addict. <laughs> and I was putting together the talks for this book tour. I was at Atlassian yesterday. Very cool place. I see you guys are actually Atlassian clients. Um, and they're applying ours. And they're applying ours. Kind of symbiosis yeah. thing going on. I thought it was really important for me in putting this talk together to tell you a little bit more about I am communication-wise. Because to me, communication is a very personal thing. Are you an iOS person? Are you an Android person? The words that we use, they're all really personal. And I am not omniscient when it comes to language or technology or business or communication. Nor am I the best communicator in the world. I am not Dale Carnegie, although I have gotten much better at it over my career. 15 years ago, for me, communication was a real challenge. It was even a liability. It got me in a lot of trouble because I didn't know what to say. I didn't understand my audience. I was too techy for them in some cases. And I know that I'm not alone. Even to this day, sometimes people don't understand me. Sometimes I don't understand other people. And then finally, I am not the arbiter of what is or what is not jargon. And if you spend more than, <coughs> like Tina will be spent about five minutes together before I throw out a few quotes. I'm a big quote guy, I love quotes. And when I think about jargon, I always go back to what Justice Potter Stewart said in 1964. He was ruling on a case about <laughs> pornography. I bet you didn't think I was going to talk about porn five minutes in. <laughs> and he famously said when asked just what is pornography, I don't know, but I know it when I see it. And I like that when I hear jargon. I can't tell you that this word is always jargon, this word is never jargon, but we've all seen people blobbyate and go out of the way to confuse people, and to me, that doesn't need to take place. I've seen bad communication quite a bit. I actually had written six books before this one, and when I thought about number seven, the last two have been about big data and data visualization. And I said to myself, Internet of Things, that's just kind of where things are going. And I stopped, because all this data technology doesn't mean a hill of beans if we don't understand it. So I decided to write this book and go on a mission to simplify business communication. Another quote for you. Jerry Seinfeld famously said, we never should have put a man on the moon. Because now we can say we can put a man on the moon, but we can't communicate well at work. Or we can't get a plug in to work properly or insert something that we should be able to do, but we can't. Fortunately, I think the solution to the communication problem is well within our reach. We're going to talk a bit about that. But first, we have to recognize it's a problem. Here's another great quote. I'll give you a book if you get this one. No Googling. Single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place. Anyone? Einstein? George Bernard Shaw. Did you Google? No. Someone in Alaskan got that. Impressive. He was an Irish playwright and co-founder of the London School of Economics. And I love this quote because, as I'll talk about in a bit based on research, many people think they're being clear they're not. I don't meet too many people who talk to being bad communicators. Most people think that they are being clear. It's very human. It's very natural. We don't realize when our messages are not received. Well, this communication, I would argue, is broken. Next book. Who are these guys? Walter White. Give him a book. There you go. <laughs> Find me later. We'll, we'll talk about Breaking Bad. Anyone watching Better Call Saul, by the way? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> the last book has a dedication. I don't want to ruin it for people who aren't caught up, but if you're a Breaking Bad fan, you will love the dedication of the last book. So why is business communication fundamentally broken? I argue there are two problems here. One is that we send way too much email. And the other is that we use far too much jargon and generally confusing language. Now, I know that you guys use Atlassian, and Atlassian and collaborative tools like that obviate the need for a great deal of email. But most of us still receive plenty of emails in a day. And I'm very curious about how many. And I want to gather some data because I'm a data guy. So I'd like everyone to briefly stand up 
and I'd like you to think about, <coughs> let's do this, the last time you went on vacation, the first day back in the office you had a certain number of unread messages in your inbox. Right? You may have checked vacation uh, email on your vacation, but go ahead and sit down if you received fewer than 25 <coughs> emails when you're on vacation. Wow. You okay. Okay. How about 50? Were there anywhere between 26 and 49 emails in your box? How about under 100? Anyone? All right, we're going to go right up to 200. I'm kind of curious now. Does anyone have more than 500 messages? Sit down if you're under five. Oh my gosh. 700? <laughs> I was on vacation for a week. It was Everyone could have a seat. So we get a lot of email. But in the new book, I argue that the problem is not email. The problem is how we use it. I like to say, playing the Indian, not the arrow. I golf, not well. Occasionally, I throw the club. I swung it. The club didn't swing itself. Now. I am old enough to remember receiving my first email. I was a sophomore in 1991 at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. It blew my mind. I used to send chain letters to my friends. He would print them out and send them to them. Oh, I could send and from another school? Get the hell out of here. I still remember my first email address. PS3Q at andrew.cmu.edu. Now, why has email caught on in the business world? A lot of reasons. Has anyone ever received a business card in the last decade that has not contained an email address? I would be shocked. I did this in Seattle a couple weeks ago and some guy actually raised his hand. So email is ubiquitous. This brings into account network effects. In other words, if I can only email part of you versus all of you, it has limited utility. This is why Facebook's trying to connect the world. Imagine if you can get in touch with anyone in the world. Huge value. It's also incredibly convenient. Imagine if you had to walk just down the hall or upstairs to send someone a message. Does anyone remember in 1998, if you wanted to send an email, you either went into a proper office or you took out your laptop and dialed into a VPN or virtual private network. The point is there was friction. These days, there's not a whole lot of friction. Why? Because if you're online at Starbucks waiting for coffee, let me just check email. Oh, I got to send a note. So there is no friction. It's incredibly convenient for us to send email. It's also incredibly cheap. I would love to run an experiment in a company that sends too much email and charge people one penny per. Not a finicky <laughs> thing, but let's say you send 100 emails a day, you got taxed a dollar a day, and at the end of a monthly pay cycle, you got a deduction on your paycheck for $20. Wow, so email. So email is incredibly cheap. It's also incredibly fast. I bet you a Coke that if email took 10 or 15 minutes in some cases to get there, sometimes you, you fact, you figure out another way. Okay. It's incredibly fast. It's also very reliable. Although here's a funny story. This book has been out now for a month. And I, I'm not even kidding. Two days after the book came out, I called up Google Apps because they're running the email I have for PhilSimon.com. And a lot of email was going into spam incorrectly. For months, people have been telling me, Phil, I know you're off email, but you're kind of taking it to an extreme. Turns out that some of my email wasn't getting through. My buddy Brian quipped, you really ticked off the email guys. <laughs> Just for getting back email. But those are the exceptions that proved the rule. I mentioned that I'm a recovering email addict. In the book, I estimate that in 23 years, I've sent probably 2.3 million email. It's a ridiculous amount of time spent just sending and receiving email. 99.99 something percent of them probably came through. The fact that I had a problem with Gmail is really the exception that proves the rule. It's also incredibly secure. Some of you are thinking, yeah, but what about that Sony hack? Again, the exception that proves the rule. Most of the time, our emails go to the person who sent it to. Now, sometimes we hit reply all, and we didn't need to, and it's happened to everyone, including me. But for the most part, our email is secure. This is not 1997 or 1998. We figured out ways to do email well. Perhaps the single greatest benefit of email is the fact that it's, and here's a big word, asynchronous. That means that if I want to send Tina an email at 2 o'clock in the morning because I can't sleep, it doesn't wake Tina up. 
you can answer that email in what you choose. It could be in Mexico when you're on vacation. You should have been reading my book. You don't have to do that. <laughs> now, forget voicemail for a minute. The phone doesn't work that way. If I want to talk to Heather on the phone, we both have to find a time that's convenient for us. And when everybody's busy, and I'm going to talk more about that in a bit, an asynchronous form of communication is actually really valuable. So email offers all these benefits, but we've gone way, way too far. In fact, it's become an absolute scourge. <clears throat> Anyone here a Dilbert fan? It's one of my favorites here. We rely on it far, far too much. And we're not clear many times with our email. So is the problem really with email? <laughs> the problem is how we use it. Last book giveaway. Anyone know this? Oh, yeah. No, I'm wrong. I can't, yeah, we gotta give it to Joe Snell. Well, <laughs> gambling is illegal at Bushwood, sir, and I never slice. <laughs> For those of you who went back on vacation and didn't check your email and had seven or 800 messages, you probably realized that you get a lot of email. Most of us don't, though, because we check it more than once during the day. I'm not there yet, but my goal is to get to three times a day. Morning, maybe before I go to the gym, afternoon, and then maybe around dinner time. I'm not there yet, I'm working on it though. How much time do we spend sending and receiving email in a day? Based on the research for the book, quite a bit. It's around 28% of the time. Seems like a lot. Now, if we sat down for two and a half, three hours, maybe that would register with us more, but because we do it very frequently during the day, five minutes here, eight minutes there, it all adds up. But let's say you accept that. Right? That's just the default means of communicating. That's how we work. We don't, anyone watch Mad Men? Inter-office memos, people typing on time. We don't, we don't do that anymore. That's not coming back. In fact, uh, the last typewriter company went out of business, I think it was a year ago. Although there's still people who repair them. So how much time do you spend on email every day? You're talking about three to four hours. Seems like a lot, doesn't it? Let's do some math. This one's too obvious. There's no book giveaway on this one. But I'm a big Simpsons fan. This equation is not going to make any sense, but it will very shortly. Let's say that you get 150 emails a day, and that's actually in keeping with the research that I did for the book. And you spend only a minute sending and receiving email, each one. Well, do the math. 150 minutes or 2.5 hours in a day, which is around one quarter of the average workday. So that number starts to make sense. But let's say you're comfortable with that number. You shouldn't be because that number is only increasing. Again, based on research from the book, this comes from Experian. If you only receive only 100 emails in a day, by 2020, you can expect to receive 200. Something has to give. It's statistic like, statistics like these that led this person to say that email has been the most basic form of communication yet devised. Bit of an obscure quote. We have one more book. Anyone know who wrote the book Hatching Twitter? Okay. It's Nick Bilton. He wrote for the he writes for the New York Times. That's a fascinating book, by the way. If you want to talk about a dysfunctional culture, one built on chaos? Twitter might take the cake. I'm going to talk a bit more about Twitter today. <laughs> I'm amazed that that company can keep its lights on. It's an amazing story. They're turning it into a movie. I'm not even joking. So what, right? We send a lot of email. It's a pain. We're always getting it. We're afraid to on vacation. If you come back and you don't check it, you're left with seven or 800 messages. In fact, Americans don't take about half of their allotted vacation time, and many times when they do, and they're snapping a photo for Instagram or doing whatever, you know, let me just quickly check in at work. Right? In point of fact, relying on email is bad business. How bad? How about $20 trillion bad? And that's not my number. This comes from McKinsey and Company. They did a study in 2012 saying that we could expect to save around $1 trillion a year if we adopt truly collaborative tools like Atlassian, which you guys use, and many others. Now, that's a big number. Let's give it some context. Anyone know Uber's current valuation? Is that up to 60? Last time I heard it was 40. I think it's 40 as well. So you're talking about 25 Ubers. Or the US gross domestic product, GDP, in 2012 was 15.4 trillion. 
So you're talking about 6 to 7% savings. Most companies would kill for that kind of savings, that kind of boost. Now, it's a huge number, and I've seen this play out many, many times. I recently spoke at a company about communication about this book, and I was amazed at the story they told me. It took two years to solve a data problem. Now, some data problems are thorny. I have dealt with some and solved some that hurt my brain. But two years for a problem, go back to my Seinfeld book. We could put a man on the moon, but it takes two years to solve a data problem. Why did that problem take so long? To make a long story short, one group was in the UK and another group was in San Francisco. And how do you think they communicated? Once those two parties got together, that complicated problem wasn't so complicated after all. This underscores the need for in-person communication. Last book, which movie? Oh. Yeah, I heard you over here. I, I heard it here first. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I heard it over here. Yeah. One of my favorites. So if we actually get together and talk to each other, problems that seem so complex actually aren't as bad. And this begs the question, if email is so inefficient, so toxic, why can't we get off of the email train? At a high level, the answer is human, not technological. I wrote a piece for Inc. I think actually I wrote, in one of my reference WP Engine, I know you guys uh, love me for that. Thank you. Uh, you're <laughs> <laughs> and as a recovering email junkie, and I write about the time in the book in which I realized I had a problem, it was a very specific moment. I started looking at solutions. I'm a tech, right? I'm a geek. There's got to be a Gmail extension or something I can do. And, and I came up with all these ways, and I ultimately decided that the answer had nothing to do with technology. The answer was me. I had to decide if I was going to engage in email conversations, if I was going to pick up the phone, if I were going to do scheduling over email back and forth with eight different people on eight different systems. And I decided the answer was no, particularly since there are tons of more affordable and powerful examples out there individually or company-wide. I'm old enough to remember the days of nascent knowledge bases and intranets. Collaboration back then was tough. There was no cloud computing as we know it today. There was no software as a service. There was no freemium model. You would spend a lot of money on an application and have consultants there implementing it, and then maybe a year later you start to use it. It's very different <coughs> these days. I bet you that Atlassian took root here very organically. Right? People probably started using it. Wow, this is useful before you know you're a paying customer. So this is not 1998. There are quite a few tools out there and you're already using some. We're just used to email. If you send 100 emails a day, let's do some more math. That's 500 a week. Give yourself four weeks of vacation. 24,000 emails in a year. If you do something 24,000 times in a year, you're going to get really good at it. There's also something official about email. If I go to lunch with Heather, and I work there and I say, Heather, uh, I don't know about Tina, she's not working out. <laughs> right? And I can't keep up. He just wants to hire you. <laughs> I can't afford her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we should um, you know, we should do something about that. And it turns out I'm right, it's been known to happen. And six months later, yeah, remember that time we went out to lunch? You don't remember it, or you remember it differently, or being hit by a bus if you won the lottery. There's something official about email. This is how companies announce things these days, right? There's, there's a CYA component to it, right? We can all say, I told you so, and we've all done it. I certainly had to do it in my consulting career. I'd spend two hours on an email that covered myself, knowing that the second I left as a consultant, he never told us that. So I'd have myself covered. Everyone's guilty of it. And again, emails are very convenient. We have them everywhere. There's no friction. Does anyone remember what happened to Justine Sacco at the end of 2013? So a few of you may know. For those of you who don't know, she tweeted something really stupid. Now, if you're 12 years old and you say something that's racist or sexist, it's not right, but you're 12. If you're a 35-year-old educated PR person at a large company and you tweet, Going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white, and go on a plane without Wi-Fi, that could go viral, and it did. So there was no friction. Any stupid thought that you have can become public. She was fired. I wonder if we just got a 
a job recently in PR. I guess they realize you won't make that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> so email is almost too convenient for us. Right? Imagine if you had to go into the office and log into a VPN or a home. It's right here all the time. In many cases, there's fear of personal interaction. It's just easier if we type it out because if I have to have a conversation and I say something I shouldn't have said, I can't just take it back. But over email, I could get it right, slave over the words. Many of us secretly complain about it, even though we love it. Right? If you imagine if you went out for vacation and you came back and you had no emails. <laughs> it must not be that important. <laughs> We actually get addicted to it. They've done studies. And the effect on the human body of receiving an email or text messages is one very similar to dopamine. It's literally a drug. And in many cases, there are cultural norms. I'm not so much talking about newer companies, what I would call greenfield organizations. I live in Las Vegas, and there's a vibrant startup community. It's not Austin. It's not Silicon Valley. But we're doing all right. Many of these companies use Atlassian. They use Trello, they use Slack, they use something. Why? Because it's a greenfield site. If you're talking about a mature organization, many of them are probably representing clients. They've been doing it this way for so long, they don't know of anything else. I was at a conference in New York, gosh, uh, about 18 months ago, and I was on a panel with a lot of other people, and a woman was saying, you should have known better. Employees would love to be more productive, the tools don't exist. I nearly jumped out of my chair, are you kidding? The tools are everywhere, we just have to use them. But many of us don't want to because if we're sending 20,000 emails in a year, it's too inconvenient for us to learn something else, even if it's really intuitive. We're unaware of the effects of too much email, some of which I'll talk about in a bit. And then finally, in many cases, we blame IT. And to me, this is so misplaced, right? Oh, IT just has to give us the tools, then we would use them. In some cases, that might be true, but I've sat through enough software demos in my day, which the first question from a prospective client was, can we get this data into Excel? Now, I'm not anti-Excel. I love Excel. I've spent thousands of hours in Excel. But if you're just trying to get the data into Excel, then what's the point of implementing the new tool? So email is often not a very effective way of communicating. If it would, then you wouldn't take two years to solve a data problem. Now, forget an organization all over the globe, people in the UK, people in San Francisco, right? Even though they speak English, it's a different type of English. Email can result in confusion and misunderstandings, even if people have known each other for over 30 <coughs> years. I actually think we have another book to give away. Anyone gets this, I will be astonished. Who are these guys? This one's obscure. So one of my favorite bands, this is Marillion. They're an English band. They've been together for over three decades. They've released 19 studio albums. They've played thousands of shows together. Sorry. Of course. At this point, they know each other really well. They've been to each other's weddings, right? And I write for Huffington Post, and it isn't just about tech. I get to reach out to real life rock stars and actors. I actually interviewed Jonathan Banks for Breaking Bad on the phone. It's awesome. <laughs> Asking about the band, he's the band's keyboardist. What are you doing? What's the new album? Blah, blah, blah. He said, stop. You're working on a book on email, right? I said, yeah, we could talk about me. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, my wife runs in the UK a PR firm, and she's always complaining about email. And it's funny, because email also often causes problems within the band of going, how do you guys not communicate well? You've known each other for over 30 years. And the drummer, who's the guy on the opposite side, Ian Mosley, evidently ticked off some of the band members with an email. And they called him up and said, hey man, what's, what's going on? You seem upset. He goes, I'm not the slightest bit upset. What do you mean? So if you know each other for 30 years and you're still having misunderstandings over email, what does that say about a company with 300 employees, 3,000? Many of them are actually new hires. Now, that's a single story and it's an interesting one. But let's look at some more data. And a couple of researchers in 2006 conducted a study, and they asked people if they thought they were being clear. And regardless of the medium, in other words, speaking or writing through email, around 80% of the time, people thought they were being clear. That number actually surprises me. I don't meet one in five people who go, yeah, I suck at communicating. No one understands me. Let's take that number, 80%. And the results were very mixed. If you heard the person, around 75% of the time, you were able to fully receive the message. In other words, not just hear the words, but understand the tone. If you're sarcastic or you 
trying to be funny. So okay, that's a decent batting average, right? 75%, not great, but we, we can live with that. With email, though, that number dropped around 15 to 6%, so roughly a coin flip, whether or not we were being clear, whether or not other people understood your message. But that's not the worst part. Most people had no idea that others were not understanding their messages. Messages were not received. That's why I like that George Bernard Shaw quote so much. This means that text-based collusion uh, communication provides the illusion of clarity. I didn't put it in here, but if you get a chance, Google key and peel text messaging. It's a great <laughs> skit, and they think they're being clear, but one guy is very calm, peel, and keys getting increasingly agitated through text, and before you know it, uh, it's interesting. So what are some of the effects of excessive email? Right? Okay, we send a lot of it, it doesn't always work. Turns out that email makes us dumb. For example, if you miss a night's sleep, you pull an all-nighter, you can expect to show up to work 10 points dumber. Now, that number has no context for you. I'm about to give you some. If you show up to work high, <laughs> your IQ only drops by four points. Please tell me no, it is it? Huh? It's, 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 it's the dude. dude. Don't get me started, I can quote that movie. It was from a Disney ad. They met Dave Pat Lebowski last year in Austin, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I went to one in San Francisco, it was fun. I thought I was obsessed with the movie. There are people who went circles of the street. And if you check email at work, your IQ drops by 10 points. In other words, you're better off showing up at work high than you are not high in checking email. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So what are some of the other effects? We become confused and overwhelmed. Research from the book uh, indicates that people can't take any more information. They're reaching a tipping point. You can't get to 200 or 300 or 400 emails in a day. Something will fall between the cracks. We make it impossible to find information. Now, Google in indexes around 30 trillion web pages. It's a ridiculous number. Right? I can't even fathom it. And most of us find what we need, whether you use Google or Bing or whatever search engine, what you need very quickly. I'm going to talk more about search in a bit. But how many of us have had the experience in which we can't find that email? And we search by keywords, negative keywords. We search by date ranges and filters and folders and senders and all these things, and we still can't find the email. I find it astonishing. I checked this morning. I have 31,000 messages in Gmail, not in the inbox, but just in the all mail folder. And I still sometimes can't find what I need. Now, email search has gotten quite a bit better than it did but it still isn't perfect. We also irritate customers and partners. I researched constant contact. Everyone's received at one point an email from constant contact, right? And the single biggest reading, reason, according to research, that people unsubscribe from email lists is, guess what? I get too many emails too frequent. And same thing with Facebook likes, interesting stuff. We also lose focus is another interesting tidbit from the book. In 2000, the average American attention span was 13 seconds, according to the National Center of, for Biotechnology and Information. That number means nothing to you because, again, you don't have any context. I'm about to give you some. That number dropped to 8 seconds in 2013. So we have a harder time paying attention. How hard? The average goldfish can pay attention for 9 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yes, we are trailing the goldfish. <laughs> So showing up to work and multitasking doesn't work. Multitasking is nonsense. And don't listen to me, listen to neuroscientists. There's such a thing as multi-changing, but no, not multitasking. This is why driving while texting is four times more dangerous than driving while drunk. At least when you're loaded, you're trying to pay attention. But if I could banish superfluous emails, if I could eliminate urgent emails, I don't think they should exist, that wouldn't fix the problem with business communication. That's only one half of it. It's a big half, but it's not the only half. The other part is jargon. And it's been a pet peeve of mine for a long time. I don't understand what these terms are. I think the following quote, someone said Einstein earlier, you were a bit ahead of me. This quote ought to be on everyone's desk in corporate America. People say, oh, well, I, I work with technology. I can't make it simple, nonsense. I've explained, one of my books is on big data. I've explained it to a 15-year-old. Now, did I do that by talking about parallel processing, fault tolerance, and unstructured data? No. 
I did it by talking about Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram, because those generate a lot of data. So this notion that it has to be complex is um, completely mis misplaced. <coughs> Jargon's always been around, but I'm going to argue now, as I do in the book, that it's become worse than ever. And here are just a few of my favorites. I'm not the arbiter of what's jargon, but when I hear price point, I just shriek. Why isn't it just price? <laughs> but this isn't just um, offending my uh, grammatical sensibilities. I'm not an English teacher. I see things all the time that make no sense to me, such as this one. Anyone know which company? The color should give it away. Facebook. Facebook. Twitter. Yeah, Twitter. Give it away. I'm colorblind. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. The dress is white and gold. Nicely <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tee that up any better. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, this comes from Twitter's vision statement on November 12, 2014. It is an utter mess. Now, if Twitter were some small startup, actually they launched 2000, 2006 at South by, or 2007 was it? So when they kind of blew up, well guess what? Twitter is no longer a cute, adorable startup. They have a market cap of $30 billion, and as such, it helps if you're actually clear with people, especially if you look at Twitter's multiple. I would short the company, but I'm convinced that if I did that, I would lose. I'd be anti-Warren Buffett. You don't want to take my investment advice. <laughs> but I wasn't the only one who felt this way. According to Dennis Berman, the Wall Street <laughs> Journal business editor, he correctly pointed out that it contains 62 syllables, four clauses, and two grammatical errors. Now, Twitter's vision statement, or mission statement, whatever one it was, contained 220 characters. Anyone else pick up on the irony here? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you not laughing, the maximum number of characters in a tweet is 140. You couldn't even fit its statement into a tweet. <laughs> now you can use Twit longer, but that's still kind of the point. Here's a Vendor's press release on its big data platform as a service. This is the first sentence. This is a mouthful. 61 words, 380 characters. I wrote a couple books on data, and I know what most of these terms mean. I don't understand what the sentence means. Last year at a conference in Las Vegas, I went up to a guy at a booth for CSC and said, oh, you're here to talk about, I don't know how you pronounce it, BD Pass. And I was so excited, because I had heard of it. <laughs> he starts telling me about all the features and all the things it can do, and I just said, stop. Are there any customers on it? What do you mean by customer? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone give you money to use it? <laughs> well, it depends on your definition. He starts pivoting. And why not? The answer was no. Now, I can't predict why that's the case, but if you don't know what you're buying, what are the odds that you're going to be successful? My first book, Why New Systems Fail, is about the near decade I spent implementing Enterprise systems, customer relation management, CRM, and enterprise resource planning, ERP, basically back office stuff, supply chain, financials, payroll. You knew exactly what you need to do. We need to pay people. And those projects were plagued by a 60% failure rate. Imagine what that number is when you don't know what you're buying. <laughs> we have one more. What quote? What movie? One of my favorites, 1967, and it's still accurate today. We have a failure to communicate. But this isn't just big companies. Here is a startup in San Francisco, right on the front page. Scott McNeely endorses it. Something about WAS technology and middleware. What does this company do? <laughs> I'm just not that smart. And they don't need to find WAS, which means work as a service, which I still don't. Work as a service. <laughs> a couple years ago, I went to a conference in New York. Actually, it was last year. And I know why. Because the day after, I went on Broadway to see Brian Cranston play Linda B. Johnson. Fifth Row Center. It's called All the Way. They're turning it into a movie on HBO. The dude can act. Anyway, after that highlight, I went to this tech conference and I sat in. I didn't go to speak. Uh, I'm not an employee of this company, and I sat there for an hour as one of its top people spewed out acronym after acronym. Finally, after about an hour, I raised my hand and said, can you explain to me what ABC and XYZ are? And I got all these quizzical looks from people. Who the hell is this guy? 
They told me what it was, and I went back to my business. Two hours later, I'm online for lunch. And people start pointing at me. They said, yeah, we were looking for you. You're the guy who asked that question. I said, yeah. We didn't know what it was either. It gets better. I said, oh, are you with the media? What company do you work for, or write for? I said, no, we're employees. Now, the only employees didn't know the acronym the CEO was using. But this isn't just executives. These are actually, in some cases, people who write and speak for a living, like the author Brian Solis in his 2000, and I think it's 11 book, The End of Business as Usual, lays out this 44-word monstrosity of a sentence. Next work? Are you kidding me? I saw this sentence, and I, um, memory served me correctly, I shut the book right then, never picked it up again. There's no reason for you to confuse people. No one has signed me this book for college. I'm not going to read this. I'm a pretty bright guy. I like to learn. Yeah, I like to look up new words. But why are you trying to confuse people? It doesn't make any sense to me. We can do better. Ugh. This leads to the quote from B.F. Skinner, the American psychologist. We are big on AI these days, right? Drones and uh, robots. Question whether, whether we think. So why is jargon so prevalent today? I've got a bunch of reasons. I'm out of books, but please tell me you know this one. <laughs> very good movie, actually, that gave very about 12 years ago. Nice guy. So in some cases, we have the usual suspects, like management consultant. There's this enormous, erroneous belief that management is a science. Right? If a company does X, then it will always be successful. It can never do Y, because it will never be successful. Nonsense. Management is not chemistry. It's not biology. Water always boils at zero degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. Always. There's no independence, right? And it, I'm sorry, freezes at zero, boils, boils at 100 degrees. That doesn't change. That's an absolute. There are no absolutes. Some companies like Yahoo were spreading itself too thin. Does anyone remember the Yahoo peanut butter manifesto? Yahoo was trying to do everything. Well, look at what Amazon's doing. They're doing a lot of different things. Yahoo has struggled for different reasons. Amazon's been pretty damn successful. So there aren't these absolutes when it comes to management. But if I'm paying you $300 an hour to consult, and after six months you run up a tab of 300 grand with your team, and your answer is, oh, you may want to try something else, and it might be successful. I'm sorry, why are we paying you? So this is why management consultants invent new terms and bastardize them. They don't want to make it seem as if there's uncertainty, but uncertainty is everywhere. Has everyone here heard of SEO, search engine optimization? No. For those of you who haven't, ha ha ha. <laughs> nice try. Um, for those of you who don't know, there are two ways to be at the top of Google. A, you can pay for it. This is how Google makes 90% of its revenue. Or B, you can grow organically. Because if all of you blog and write, Phil Simon is the best public speaker on the planet, please do. <laughs> Google looks at those backlinks, and all of a sudden, they show up organically, right? Does anyone know what percentage of clicks go to that top link? Take a guess. 90%. It's higher than 20, lower than 95. It's actually around 33. Now, that's a general term. If you occupy that top spot on Google, you can expect to receive about one in three hits. As that number drops off considerably, note the difference between 10 and 11. This means that people, for the most part, stick to that first page. They don't change their default settings. You may know this, you may not. You can actually put your default settings to 100 search results. That's what I do. Most people don't change their defaults, and companies know this and look at this data. This is why a horribly constructed acronym like BDPAAS actually makes sense. If you Google data platform as a service, not that I understand what that means, you typically will see at the top a company called Cloud that IBM bought a couple of years ago for it was over a billion dollars. So that's already gone. You missed the boat on that. What if you're a big data platform as a service, and what if you're a next generation one to boot? It doesn't make any sense. But this is why we're seeing more jargon than ever, in my opinion. We're also, for some reason, determined to sound smart or important. I had a piece today go live on Fast Company, and I know it was edited, because the woman used the word leverage. I never use that word. I will always use the word use. Why? Use is shorter. It essentially means the same thing. Eventually, I will get to words that are polysyllabic, and I can't shorten those. Remember people's attention spans? Eight seconds? Try using a bunch of long words in a row to see if they can follow you. People typically can't. Someone came up to me in Seattle after one of my talks and said, you're telling me something different than what my college professor told me. The woman was 23, 24, if I had a guess. So my college professor said, As if at all possible, use the biggest words. Don't do that. There's also fear of simplicity, right? How can we pay you so much if things are so simple? Can't we just automate that? Again, it's misplaced. Remember Einstein's quote, there's nothing wrong with using simple words. 
Many organizations don't know anything else. Has anyone seen the movie or read the book, The Smartest Guys in the Room? It's about Enron's collapse. Fantastic book, great documentary. And at one point, Enron was worth, actually, they were based in Texas, right? 70, Houston. Houston, thank you. $70 billion, and then they went to put. The company engaged in incredibly questionable, if not downright illegal, accounting practices. Now, when Jeff Skilling, who was one of the two top guys in the company, went up to people and said, can we do this? And you said, no, it's illegal. I'd ignore you. I'd eventually find someone like Hans, who said, I think you can do this. Confirmation bias. <laughs> people would mimic his actions because he was a very powerful figure. In mean, many organizations that the CEO is confusing us, you're not about to say, I don't get it, right? You appear, you appear to be silly or not, you're not understanding. There's just more stuff out there. Interesting fact, in 1972, the average person saw 500 marketing messages in a day. Do you know what that number is today? 5,000, yes, exactly. It's gone up by an order of magnitude. We are seeing more stuff than ever. Right? Great stat from the book, The Human Face of Big Data. The average person today is exposed to more information in a single day than his or her counterpart was in his or her entire lifetime in the 15th century. It's mind-boggling how much information is flying at us. Things are happening faster than ever. There's a chart in the book that shows how long it took for about a quarter of the US population to adopt the telephone, and the radio, and the television, and computers, and smartphones, and the internet. Technologies are coming at us faster and faster than ever. And we're oblivious to the effects of jargon. In other words, what does all this mean? It erodes credibility and trust. In 2010, a couple of Swiss research, researchers conducted a study, and they found something that's very intuitive. People who spoke simply and clearly were actually viewed as more credible than those that used legalese or bureaucratic language. Here's the ironic part of the study. The authors have called for greater, not making this up, linguistic concreteness. <laughs> you need to be more linguistically concrete, OK? It confuses and overwhelms employees and potential customers. No one likes to feel silly, but that's one of the reasons if you're getting too much information and you can't make sense of it, it's easy to tune out. It also results, in my opinion, in lost sales. Are you really going to buy something if you don't understand it? There's no doubt in my mind that it causes delays. Even if you're clear about what you're doing, the odds aren't great in many cases for different reasons. People often speak different languages. Clarity also props with jargon. There's just no reason, I think, for it. Even if you're clear with people, there's no guarantee that you'll have a successful result. But if you're unclear with people, I can pretty much guarantee that you won't. Or if you do, it's by accident. So I'm going to end, and then I think we'll have time for a few questions. All right, I convinced you. How do we start? What are some things that I can do to communicate better? <coughs> Look for communication canaries in a coal mine. I pitched my book tour to a company, I won't name it. They make collaboration software. And on the front of the web page was the email address of the PR firm. So I sent a note and started emailing back and forth. And I wasn't picking on you, Tina. I invoked my free email role at the three of you talk. I sent my phone number and I put a link to my schedule. It was youcanvoke.me. Simple site. A child can use it. It's free here. Click, boom, email confirmed. Woman writes back. No time for this. Have to engage in email. So I broke my rule. I can be a little snarky. I hope you appreciate the irony here. You're representing a company that's trying to minimize email, yet you will only correspond with me over email. <laughs> it's also important to avoid the curse of knowledge. I, I think it's called Hamlin's Law. I just found out about this on Wikipedia. It's not in the book. But it's never ascribe to malice that which can be explained by stupidity. In other words, people <laughs> are trying to be mean. They just don't think. And this happens to everyone. Again, I'm not a perfect communicator. I did a speaking gig three four weeks ago in San Jose, and before the book had come out, I, I asked my contact if he wanted to see the galley of the book. He writes back, what's a galley? It's a fair question. A galley is just the electronic copy that becomes the book. But I fell into the curse of knowledge. He didn't know what I knew. So sometimes it's an honest mistake. So just be aware of that. And it's also important to clearly define your terms. Most people here, based on WP Engine, my interaction with people, understand what SEO is. It took me, what, a minute to describe it at a high level? Of course there's more to it. But if there is someone in here who doesn't know what SEO is, at least now that person understands that it doesn't take very long. I'm a big fan of saving your syllables. If you can use a simpler word in lieu of a more complicated one, why not? Because of the research I've done and my own impatience, I don't engage in email conversations. 
just pointless. Check out that key, key and field skip, it's a good one. And then finally, remember that the word communicate means to make a comment. We forget that. This isn't mine, but I've seen it before. I love this tag. <laughs> Here's how you get in touch with me. And I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Yes? Was that picture of Homer Simpson that you flashed about a third of the way through the presentation from the episode in which he becomes an inventor and discovers the mass of the Higgs boson 14 years before the CERN researchers did? Because I think that's what that was. I don't know, but I thought I was a big Simpsons fan. <laughs> <laughs> the episode's called The Wizard of er Evergreen Terrace. <laughs> I, did, I did not know that. You know that reminds me of, though, there's a great Saturday Live skit, which I love. It's back in the early 90s. Give it to when uh, William Shatner was hosting. Yeah. You saw that one? And people were asking him, what was the combination of the portal save in episode 14? And, Guys, it's just a TV show. <laughs> you! And they've all got the spot here. <laughs> you! Have you ever kissed a girl? No. <laughs> so that, that is an incredibly detailed question. I will take your word for it because you got me beat. Other questions? <laughs> Do it. Okay, well, if there's another question. Yes? So, how do you draw a distinction between jargon and like useful domain specific language? And, and like, when chefs talk to each other, it's like they have their own patois, or engineers, right? So, how do you be, is it just knowing your audience? And who you're That's a huge part of it. Um, it's only jargon if other people don't understand it. There's a story in the book about during my consulting days. There was a particularly thorny issue with this Lawson application. Lawson has its own nomenclature. It's incredibly specific. PA31 is for applicant, and PA35 is for skills, and da 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 da, tables, databases, blah, blah, blah. This consultant and I were both certified in the application. We both knew it cold. We were communicating. We were making things common. A non Lawson person wouldn't know what the hell we were talking about. One of the best moments I had as a consultant took place in 2003, I believe. Make a long story short, I had to build an access database that did a few things. I sat down with the DBA, and there was um, a woman by the name of Mary Jo, who was in benefits and Excel kind of scared her. She didn't really get technology and data, and she didn't have to do her job, to be fair. I realized there was no way for me to have that conversation with both people at the same time. I told Mary Jo, you know, why don't you get a cup of coffee? I sat down with Paul, the DBA, database administrator, and we went through a technical detail, the, the schematics, uh, enterprise relationship diagrams, ERDs. He walks out, five minutes later, shakes my head, goes, perfect. It's exactly <coughs> what he, he leaves, Mary Jo comes back. And at a high level, I say, I'm taking data from here, massaging it, and moving it there. She squints and looks at me and goes, there's more to it, right? I go, there is, I'm happy to tell you. She goes, no, 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 perfect, exactly what I <laughs> So understanding your audience is absolutely huge. Yes? Do you think it counts to think that you know email and the way that you use email is actually its own language in and of itself, so it's kind of just as valid as any other form? But I know the point of the conversation here was that email is a problem, but I just think back to the use of punctuation and, and if somebody emails me and I choose not to get back to them until a little bit of time in order to set up some sort of psychological edge to the conversation that means something, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I use the email function in a way that's very similar to body language and tone of voice and things like that. It's just more, I deliver it by the use of punctuation and when I choose to use the application. Okay, so are there emojis that reflect your body language? I'm just curious. No, I wouldn't use an emoji because that's that would be that, that has some sort of other connotation to it. Mm -hmm. But did you ever run into that? Like, what do you think about that idea? Or is it just so crazy? I would disagree with the notion that you're emailing and it's very much resembling like personal actual, communication. Yeah. Right. I'm not an expert on nonverbal communication, but people are will tell you that 80 to 90 percent of communication is nonverbal. Now, look, you may have a relationship with someone. This question actually came up in Seattle. And this woman had said, since there's been a lot of um, talk about the Ellen Powell gender discrimination lawsuit in Silicon Valley, and it's bringing whether or not it happened or not, and Kleiner Perkins is almost moved, it's an important conversation to have. He said, Well, I'd be taken seriously as a woman if I use emojis. And the short answer was, I don't know. You might have a great relationship with a colleague, so Keenan and I can joke. I've already joked before, and she knows that I'm joking. But if the CEO doesn't know who you are and you put that in there, maybe you're professional. The bottom line is that all communication is contextual. You might actually be able to communicate in a way with email that eliminates all the problems that I mentioned. If that's the case, that's great. But I think that it's wrong to assume that everyone gets you. Because you might have gone to lunch with, if Heather and I went to lunch, we know what we're talking about, we had that relationship. One of the biggest mistakes I made early in my career is that I forgot that I did have an existing relationship with someone. And they say, who the hell is this wise ass? Once I had that relationship with someone, they go, yeah, that's just filled with <laughs> uh, How many more time? Do you have one more? How about one more? Kira? Yeah. Uh, so 
so sometimes I've heard people say that when it comes to email communication, that it should almost be the kind of like you're solidified what you've already discussed rather than trying to communicate back and forth. It's like go here, have a conversation, talk to the person face to face, and then kind of document it in an email where it's just hey, this is what we talked about. Is this, is this what you remember from that conversation? Rather than trying to solve. decide something or solve something back and forth like that. I'd argue that a great tool for brainstorming is getting together in person or on Skype or a video session. I don't see anything wrong with confirming, okay, to recap our meeting, so-and-so has this to do. Um, I don't think, though, it has to be an email. It can be codified in one of the Atlassian tools or anything else. We rely on email. Um, I try to distinguish what I need to do in other words, um, anyone use Todoist as an app? Okay. I like it. Um, but it doesn't matter. Use that, use something else. If you think about your inbox being the center of your life, professionally and personally, then it actually makes sense for us to constantly check it. We touch our cell phones 150 times a day, more than we touch our faces. This is why the Apple Watch scares me. There's no friction. Yeah, Heather, what's going on? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. Um, I don't want my emails or my inbox to contain things I need to do. Right? I want to do is to tell me, hey, Phil, it's Tuesday morning. It better call Saul's now on iTunes so I get to watch it. I don't want to go into detail for that because I go in to do one thing, and now I've got four urgent emails, and all of a sudden I forgot why I was there to begin with. So I don't think that you need to have 700 apps or 70, but the notion that email is this ubiquitous tool that should be used for everything is ridiculous. When Google announced that this new inbox app is going to make email smarter, hey, I'm all for making things smarter, but I don't want to be a slave to my inbox. I think that it's really unhealthy for us to constantly be checking. They say that if you get distracted, it takes you five times as long to get back into the flow of what you're doing. One of my favorite books, I reference this in a couple of my books, it's called Flow by, I can't pronounce his name, Mihail Csikszentmihalyi. And he did a bunch of research and he looked at people, athletes, artists, professionals, musicians, and when they did their best work. And invariably it was when they weren't distracted, right? They were focused on what they were doing. They were in the zone, and I've been there. I've been there as a writer. I've been there as a Crystal Reports guy. And I get so much done, and I look down at my clock, and I was uninterrupted for two hours, and I got so much done. More so than if I had been checking this, oh, what do I need to do now? So I think there's a lot to be said for sometimes leaving these things unplugged. Anyway, I'll hang out if anyone has other questions, but thank you all. For thank you so